Mitten da. Robin, nice to see you. Um, I haven't quite worked out what time it is where you are, but it is yeah. early afternoon That's for us. Day. So it's, it's, it's early day. Day. Yeah, it, 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 exactly, it's exactly. Fifth um, hour of Roderick's in Australia. They, um, below Broken Hill in Australia. They, they, they're the safest way of doing it, yes. Well, welcome, uh, and thanks very much for coming to speak to us. Um, this tech is wonderful, isn't it? We, we can speak very informally. Um, now, you come from Broken Hill, which is in the outback, and I think the outback is also a little bit of a mystery to us. Where, where exactly is Broken Hill, and why is it in the outback? Well, I can tell you where Broken Hill is, but I think the outback remains a mystery as to where it actually is. So um, we're a mining town in the far west of New South Wales, so far west that we're almost in South Australia. So it's about a two-day drive to our state capital, and um, we're, we're out in the bush, very dry country, it doesn't rain much, but uh, beautiful rugged hills and kangaroos hopping through the hills and that sort of thing. So I isolation and, you know, being away from uh, the big cities. So basically the outback is out, out in, in, in the wilderness, I suppose, is that right? Is that what you would say? Yes, so, yes. it's not, um, you haven't got people on farms growing crops and that sort of thing. Right. Now, um, you've got this wonderful choir, and I can see that you know, the Broken Hill community voices in the background there, wonderful. Now, tell me how you started. Well, we, we started in 2000. There was a, a woman who came to Broken Hill. Um, we would say she was from away. She wasn't born in Broken Hill, um, but she wanted to start up a choir. She'd been in a choir in other towns that sang social justice songs, and she wanted to do the same thing here in Broken Hill. Um, so I joined that choir back in 2000 and then about five years later after the musical director left I became the musical director of the choir. So we sing mostly social justice songs but also world music um, and songs about Broken Hill and the region. Gosh that's quite a, a wide wide repertoire. I like the idea of social justice song that's uh, a good way of connecting with the world isn't it? Yeah well we, we sing songs that are specifically about, you know, peace or something like that, but also we sing songs from lots of different countries that um, I suppose it reflects Broken Hill's got a very multicultural heritage. So those songs in themselves, because we're singing songs from other countries, that helps to engender respect for, for all different cultures. Gosh, it does, doesn't it? In a sense, then... Um... It's very natural for you to slot in and do some Cornish songs as well in that case, I think. Yes, because the Cornish are part of that rich tapestry that makes up Broken Hill. Yeah. Yes. And we've, we've got this uh, a wonderful song from you, um, Kernova's Viking. Um, perhaps the best introduction to the choir is to listen to Kernova's Viking. Cornwall forever will rally at the call. Speaking. 
Wonderful. Uh, it's fantastic to hear an Australian choir singing in, in the Cornish like that. Um, what encouraged the choir to sing actually in Cornish? Uh, well, the Cornish people have been part of Broken Hills, um, part of the fabric of Broken Hill right from the start. The, the first mining leases were pegged here in 1883, and there was a Cornishman that was there right at the, the start, and Cornish miners came here um, Oh, well, in the, the 1880s, into the 1890s, a lot of them came from Moonta where there was other mining activity and some came from the gold fields in Victoria as well. So it was sort of drawing people from all different places. So, so they were already probably second generation Cornish by the time they arrived at Broken Hill because they arrived in um, Wallaroo and, and the uh, Copper Triangle, I think probably 1840, something like that. Well, 1860s, I think it was. 1860s, yes, 1860s. Mostly yeah. when they, most of them were second generation once they yeah. came to break. There were a few sort of first generation, but mostly second generation. And it's um, it's amazing that people are still proud of their Cornish heritage, you know, 140 years later. Gosh, I think it is. And, and it's still part of uh, your identity in Broken Hill. Um. Did the choir find it very difficult to learn Cornish? You're a Cornish speaker, I think. Um, I am now. I've been learning Cornish for a couple of years. I've just finished my second grade exams. But when we did that first song, um, uh, I hadn't really had any experience of uh, speaking Cornish or singing in Cornish before. So uh, I had some help from someone in the uh, South Australian Cornish choir to teach me the pronunciation, make sure that I got it right, and then I sort of taught the choir. So, um, and they were very enthusiastic about it because quite a few of them have got Cornish heritage themselves. So it was a great Gosh. process. It must be a wonderful feeling to be able to connect up with the Cornwall in, in, in that way. And, and they and they liked singing in Cornish. It's, it's a very good way of connecting with the language, isn't it, to sing in Cornish? Well, it is. Um, if, if you're trying to learn a language, sometimes it's easier to, to sing the language and then the, the speaking sort of comes more easily. Gosh, yes, that's, ama that's amazing. Yes, it's, it's um, and I mean, it, it must be quite a small community in Broken Hill. Is that right? Uh, well, there's about 18,000 people. Um, so a lot of them are, are, have been here for several generations and those are the ones that have got uh, the Cornish ancestry then we've got the people who've come more recently and we after the second world war there were Greeks Italians Filipinos just a real melting pot so you've got those older generations that have got the Cornish heritage and then it's all enriched by these other cultures that have come in as well but, but uh, there's a very solid base of people who still relate to their Cornish heritage um, you sent you sent me some lovely photographs which I, I use in that video montage to go with the song, and you can see the story of Cornwall there, and and you can see the the, the mine working to that, and um, but you can also see them set in this very different environment, this um, the hills, the rolling hills, and that of the outback, um, and that that is Broken Hill, and is does the mining dominate the town? Is it is it is it can you see it wherever you are in the town? Well, there's absolutely no doubt when you're coming to Broken Hill that you're in a mining town because the line of load runs right through the middle of the town. So you've got the wow. skip dumps, the line of load, the mines right in the middle of the town. So in the early days, you had these poor Cornish miners who were on foot or on a bicycle at best. So they wanted to be not too far away from the mine. Otherwise, they'd be walking half the day to get to work. <clears> so all the houses grew up around the, the mine. Yeah, so it, it just it, dominates the centre of town. That that's very much um, a, a Cornish thing. What might I say it Cornwall and the Industrial Revolution is that the the miners were living where they worked, uh, and the, the the mine landscape was was part of the landscape you lived in. Um, and it sounded like that's the same in Broken Hill. Mm. There, there were lots, oh, lots of mines in the district. I remember there, there was one mine called the Consul Mine, which is you know, that's a very familiar yes. Cornish thing. And it was just on the edge of the main line of load, and there was a Consul Street. So you had the mine, and then right there next to it, Consul Street. 
you had people living and working at the mine. Gosh. I think that's that's been reclaimed by the skimp dumps now. But it, it's it sounds like you're driving between Redruth and Campbell <laughs> with all these mine workings around. I I imagine that um, once it was underway, the the Cornish miners who moved there must have felt very at home. They they did indeed, and that, there were so many of them. Um, in South Australia, they formed a Cornish association, I think it was 1890, and then all the Cornish people in Broken Hill, inspired by that, formed a Cornish association the next year. They said, if they can do that in Adelaide, we can do it here. So they'd wow. get together, and music was always a big part of that, and they'd have rousing renditions of Trelawney to finish off. We get some wonderful reports of the diaspora and in Australia and in, in some of the um, local newspapers of around that time. So there was clearly a lot of uh, toing and throwing. Now, what interests us obviously is is the culture and the music. Now, one of the traditions which I understand went out there was was Christmas and you and the, the wassail. And you've got a, a lovely wassail you sung for us. Should we, should we listen to that now? That sounds like a great idea. Now David, you give us our blessed Lord our toast. He gave us a song, our devil's friend toast. Guns love in wassail, 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 wassail. Lord, we love the joy wassail. Our mistress, our mister, Tell us how you came to sing the Red Ruth Wazale. Well, that particular one, I um, visited Cornwall in 2017 and I happened to buy a few music CDs while I was there. And one of them was called Nadali, a Cornish Christmas, uh, and it had lots of wonderful carols on it. And our choirs learned a couple of those. I've got a bit of show and tell here. I don't know if you can see that. Oh, right, That's I remember CD that one well. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wonderful um, CD and 
The wassail in particular, I just thought this will be a great one for our choir. Um, so I, I love the old traditions associated with the wassail uh, and the tongue, tongue intrigue humour that's, that's part of the song as well. Um, but this particular one, we tend to sing it, so at Christmas time, you know, when it's 40 degrees here in Australia and we're wearing short sleeves, we do have lots of lovely Christmas traditions and our choir will um, be busking at um, community Christmas events. So last Christmas when we were busking, we, we sang that wassail and we were raising money for a, a local charity that um, provides meals for homeless people. And I couldn't uh -huh. help thinking about the connection between the words of the wassail and what we were doing. So we were raising money you know, for people who, who didn't have enough. Um, I'll just quote a couple of, or paraphrase a couple of words from the, the wassail. So, you know, come on, you well-off people, you're, you're living a life of ease. Please give us poor folks something to drink or spare a few coins. So that's what we were saying, yeah, spare a few coins to help those who are less fortunate. Gosh, so I, I just felt that real connection. It's not amazing. It's actually, I was going to ask, you know, there's a, quite, there's a slight strangeness. We're singing songs that were sung in, in, in the winter uh, in Cornwall and singing them in what is your midsummer. Um, but when you present it like that, it's right on the ball, isn't it? I mean, that's what the what happened. The people were, were very, um, they were hungry. They, they, they were actually out begging, effectively, using the wassail to raise money for, to have a good time at Christmas. And, um, and that's exactly what you were doing. You were raising money for people who, who needed that support. I think that's fantastic, yeah, yes. Putting a, another layer of meaning to that traditional topic. Yes. But it, it seems like the Cornish took a lot of their culture in terms of singing and, and, and Christmas traditions out to out to you. Um, and um, Broken Hill has retained those traditions, despite it being yeah. sunny. <laughs> Yeah, in, in particular, the, the, the Cornish carols were very popular. They were, they were very popular in South Australia and also here in Broken Hill. So right from the early days, probably up until about the 1950s, uh, the Cornish carols were sung and were very popular. Um, I've got another little show and tell here. Oh, right. <laughs> this is um, a collection of Cornish carols. This belonged to my grandmother. Oh, right. So if you ra raise it up a little bit and we can see up, can the whole thing. Wow. Yes. And your grandmother had that. Yeah. So that's just you know a little part of the, the Cornish carol singing that, that used to happen here in Brogan Hill. But something interesting that I was thinking is um, they were very traditional 19th century carols and, and they were wonderful and popular at, at a particular time. And then the popularity sort of um, waned a little bit. Um, but the wassail is, is sort of a tradition that goes back even further, and yet it's sort of breathing a new vitality into some of the Christmas traditions. So it's an, it's an interesting mix. It is an inter interesting mix because I, I found a reference to the wassail in the medieval Cornish mystery plays. So we are really going back a very long way there. Hundreds and, and hundreds of years. Yeah. Yes, and here we are with, with effectively a living tradition. Um, with the Cornish diaspora in Australia, in the Australian outback. I mean, that, that's fantastic. Sometimes there's a feeling that um, the diaspora connects up with a, the family history Cornwall, with, with a very different Cornwall than the one we experience today. Um, but there's a sense in which by singing in Cornish, you're connecting with a modern Celtic revival. That, that's a really interesting thought um, because we didn't set out to become part of the, the, the Cornish revival, but, but that's become part of our journey. And um, my pathway into music and language study was fueled by my, an interest in family history. But then, you know, I've moved on and it's really exciting to discover new songs and see what's actually happening now in Paul. So you've got to remember what happened in the past, but sort of become immersed in the present and look at the future as well. Now, you, you're clearly a thriving choir. What what are your plans for the future? Uh, well, I've been really enjoying, um, as I've been learning the Cornish language, I've been sort of um, doing all sorts of researching and finding new Cornish songs. So everywhere I look, I'm discovering all these exciting new Cornish folk songs. So, um, 
I think it's lovely the way the Cornish culture and the folk songs are sort of evolving. And um, we so I've got a few other songs that I think will be lovely for the choir at the moment. Um, well, you are making these songs your own. You're singing them in your own way. You're you're adapting them to what you do, which I think is wonderful. Yeah. Well, to me, um, and I, I think you've said something similar in the past, you know, folk music should be allowed to live and breathe so yes. that it takes on meaning for every every community, every choir that, that encounters it. So, so it really resonates for that particular group. Um, so one of the songs that, that we've had just started singing in the last week or so, uh, it's by um, Mathi Abdawi, and it's called uh, Holya Spiris Tremor. So it's about a Cornish miner who goes overseas to Wallaroo. And when I first stumbled on this, I thought, oh, we've got to do that one, because a lot of people went to Wallaroo and then they came to Broke oh, Hill. Yes, yeah. Um, so um, so that's we, we've just started doing that and um, Mark very kindly gave us permission to sing the song and uh, very generously he also allowed me to add an extra verse uh, where the person then goes on to Broken Hill. That's fantastic. Now, I, I, I wonder if you might have a, a snip of, of Matty's song for us to listen to, Holly Spiris Tremor. Yes, actually, we've only just started learning it, but um, we can give you, I guess, a sneak preview of how it's going so far with the choir. Let's listen to it. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, Mirage. <laughs> Sorry, no, you're with us. Sorry, we, we were in the in a different window. You're only coming out of the computer here, so I don't know if you can hear Robin um, on the speaker. A little bit. A little bit? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, it's lovely to see you again. Um, I so enjoyed that conversation with Mer. Thank you. Um, and I love this uh, kind of very contemporary sense of musical exchange and connection between... Cornwall and Broken Hill as you give the old songs new contacts and uh, context and even adapting to speak to Broken Hill today. Um, I've had a look online and we've got some people joining us but I haven't seen any questions in the chat yet so um, do you have a question for Robin from the room at all? Yes, Mel. Which cowls were in her grandma's book? 
Oh, um, Mel is asking which carols are in your grandmother's book? Here, just a moment. <laughs> Turning up as much as possible. Um, so there were a lot of old seasonal carols. Um, things, I'll just read some of them out. Awake with joyful strains of bird. Arm on the listening ear of night by J.H. Thomas. Um, Blessed child of royal birth, um, let us swell our tuneful note by J.L. Davy. So they're not carols that I've sung. It's uh, I've sort of get this as a, a piece of the history. So I, I've got the book um, there just to refer to. Yeah, it's a lovely book. So it's just a it's a nice connection to a, a previous <coughs> um, tradition. Yeah, absolutely. Any, any more questions in the room? Yes, please. Not so much a question as an observation, something that you said, um, um, and also I heard uh, mentioned a couple of nights ago on stage, the role of Cornish poetry and song in helping spoken Cornish to flow and be a little bit less sporting than it can be sometimes. So, um, just relaying over, we have a comment from the from the back of the room um, about the role of Cornish language, poetry, and song. Cornish song and poetry in helping spoken Cornish flow. Cornish song and poetry helping spoken Cornish flow. That's something I actually kind of wondered if you could speak a little bit more about your experience of singing in Cornish amongst your choir members and what the reaction to singing in <coughs> Cornish has been. But as I mentioned earlier, I've, so firstly I've been learning Cornish, but the rest of the choir um, only know a few words of Cornish, so they, they really enjoy uh, singing songs in Cornish and um, I suppose embrace the culture so that they've been keen to, to learn a few words. But um, I think the people who don't speak the language, being able to sing it is a, a, an easier way into the language. So it engages different parts of the brain. Um, so I think they, 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 this, they engage more easily having not spoken any Cordy, singing it rather than trying to learn to speak it first. And, and I've heard that as well. That's so interesting. I wonder, I'm sure there are other people in who, in the audience and elsewhere who had similar experiences. Um, any any more questions from our audience? Um, you can't see us, Robin, but we've got a good good gang of people here in the Dow Room at Crescent Kerno who really enjoyed that lovely presentation. Yes, two over there. Any connection between um, the Celtic revival, um, the Celtic revival of the Renaissance? Um, and the voice um, in Australia, I think you mentioned the voice. Yeah, okay, so question number one is um, concerning thinking about the Celtic revival and the Brythonic revival, we said, and thinking, thinking about um, the voice, and you were talking about the referendum recently. Yes, um, do you see any doubt? The question is, do you see any connection between the two, the two things? So the voice referendum in Australia you're talking about? Yes. Um, I, I can see a lot of, <coughs> as, as I've been learning Cornish and learning about the struggle to sort of maintain culture and language, uh, I can see a really strong parallel between that and the Indigenous people in Australia um, keeping their, their language and culture strong. So here in um, the Broken Hill area, there's the Widyakali people and the Barkinji people. And uh, the Barkinji people in particular have been, uh, they started teaching uh, their language in the school. So there's a very strong sense of uh, trying to maintain culture and language, uh, dance, art, all, all the different art forms that come along with it. So it's an interesting parallel between what's happening with the Cornish language and what's happening with Indigenous culture in Australia. So uh, it, it gives you a sort of a, a deeper respect for what Indigenous 
people are doing in maintaining their own language and culture. Yeah, absolutely. It's, yeah. I've also had a, a, a really nice connection. I did a talk here in Broken Hill uh, for the local historical society about the Cornish heritage. And it's traditional to uh, acknowledge the, the Indigenous people of the region you're in. So when I did that particular talk, I did the acknowledgement of country in Cornish and made the connection between you know, me learning Cornish and Indigenous people keeping their own language strong. So yes, there's a, there's a very strong sense of maintaining your culture, you know, whether it's Indigenous or whether it's Cornish. Yeah, that's um, it's so interesting in that um the question of language reclamation and giving you that insight and perspective into um yeah the the struggle of first nation and indigenous communities is is you know perhaps unexpected on the one hand but obvious when you think about it in, on the other um richard you had a question um it's quite light-hearted um <laughs> i'm always interested in food and um wondering if cornish cuisine has survived and broken hill did you catch that, Robin, at all? Um, no, I'm waiting for you to <laughs> Richard's question says, he says, it's very light-hearted. He likes uh, talking and writing about food and wondered if any Cornish cuisine has remained in Broken Hill. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I, the, the, we, I lost the, the sound there a bit. Oh, sorry. Just for again, please. Is there any remnant of Cornish cuisine in Broken Hill? Cornish cooking? Oh. Part, there's um, pasties have been part of Broken Hill culture, uh, South Australia and Broken Hill culture. Um, people talk in other places about Cornish pasties, but here they're just pasties. So uh, that, that aspect. Um, different people that I've spoken to who have had Cornish family in Broken Hill from the very early days talked about um, some of the other um, cakes and things that the, their family used to make as well. But uh, Cornish um, pasty suppers were, were very popular, particularly in the early days. Yeah. Mm, I can imagine, even if they're not Cornish pasties, you know and we know <laughs> that there's that connection. Um, we've got a couple more minutes. I uh, don't want to cut anyone else's question off if you've got one. Yes? What about younger people in Broken Hill? And I'm thinking about, well, under 20s or maybe under 30s. Have they got any interest at all in Cornish heritage and culture? Right. Um, the question is, uh, what about younger people in Broken Hill, say the under 20s and the uh, under 30s? Um, do they have any interest in Cornish heritage in the area? Uh. But that's an interesting one because I've, I've mainly spoken to older people. Uh, it seems to be as you get into your 40s and 50s that you start taking an interest in the heritage. Um, and the bookshop where I work, I thought you, you would have seen in the, the uh, pre recorded part the little sign, you know, Cornish in here. Um, and I often get people coming into the shop telling me all about their Cornish heritage. Um, but it seems to be as you get older, you, you sort of become more interested in that. So it would be interesting to see um, what happens with the next generation. Did you hear all that? Okay, great. That's that's um that's in that's my sense as well. Is that certainly in overseas communities that I've visited, um, as people get older and sometimes have more time to think about these things if they've retired or have. Um, yeah, have an interest that they want to pursue and they get interested in their heritage and their local area. Maybe not necessarily they have uh, Cornish family heritage, but they are interested in engaging in their local area's history. Um, yeah, it's it's one of those things that um, it always seems to think, oh, the average sort of demographic is of an older, of an older age. But in my experience and conversations, it's something that people often age into as an interest. Um, and I think that will happen because here in Broken Hill we've got 140 years of Cornish heritage. So obviously those earlier generations have died, but the, the subsequent generations have taken that interest and, and maintained the stories. Yeah, lovely. 
I think we've got time for one more question, if there is one in the room. We, I think we have... No? Yes, no? Okay. Robin, I think that that is the end of our questions. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it was such a pleasure to hear you talking um, about the choir and all the work that you've done and, and, and the songs, just fascinating. Um, please stick with us on the Zoom meeting if you'd like to, but I know that it's late in Australia. <laughs> so, um, yes, don't worry, mm. you'll be able to listen back to all the rest of the presentation as part of the live stream when this is finished. But um, thanks so much and a round of applause for Robin, please. A round of applause for Robin, please. Thank you. Thank you.